Thousands of people take to the streets to protest Quebec's vaccine passport. Never in the history of this country has this kind of behavior been pushed upon its citizens and it is wrong. No one should be able to force or mandate someone to take something that they do not wish to do. We've been stuck inside for so long. We deserve to have some fun. Like, look at this. Everyone's having so much fun. Like, this is not, like, this is harmless. Honestly, it's harmless. Others were worried about government control through BC's new vaccine card. If only the healthy people are okay and the people who are at risk get ill, isn't that how it's supposed to be? I, I mean If only the healthy people are okay and the people who are at risk get ill, isn't that how it's supposed to be? Get ill, isn't that how it's supposed to be? Isn't that how it's supposed to be? Isn't that how it's supposed to be? I... The way it's supposed to be, huh? Restriction of freedoms, you say? Who would have thought a virus could bring so much division? But things are mostly alright now, aren't they? We got vaccines, we can meet people in public again. Most of us can start returning to normal. Most. But not all. Because the people who are apparently supposed to get sick, well, we don't want to get sicker. Turns out, we want to live. Because we're human too. And we know this pandemic isn't done yet. Don't believe us? Then we'll show you. My name is Robbie Thompson. I'm 23 years old. I like music, playing video games, nature, and I'm still in isolation. I was born with a heart defect called the idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, which required me to get a heart transplant at only 18 months old to survive. This new heart failed when I was four, and I had to get another new heart, my current one, at five. Because this heart that I have is not my own, my immune system tries to attack it. So, I must take immune suppressant medication in order to survive. Funny thing is about suppressing your immune system though, is you get sick far easier, vaccinated or not. As a result, I'm classified as medically vulnerable, and so, still must isolate due to COVID-19. And when I see or hear people disregard COVID safety protocols, or the vaccines and masks all together, it makes me feel forgotten, alone, less than human. But it's not just me. There's a whole world of medically vulnerable people out there that are in the same situation. So I'm going to show you just who some of those medically vulnerable people are. And I'm uh, sick or not feeling well, Brian's there for me. Same with if he's when he wasn't feeling well, well, except for when he went for chemo. I she ate my lunch. I ate <laughs> at chemo. I've known the Bensons for years. Despite their health problems, they're some of the most joyful and active people I know. I was born with cystic fibrosis, but was not diagnosed until I was 14. Life expectancy at that time was 15. I was also diagnosed with uh, diabetes at the age of 21, and it was cystic fibrosis related diabetes. I am insulin dependent, have been since I was diagnosed. But I was able to survive uh, many years of healthy, active living. I became a teacher and taught for 35 years. I was able to last with my lungs until I was 40. And I needed a double lung transplant. And so that occurred December 1st, 1999. 
three years ago, my kidneys failed due to the transplant drugs that I'm on. And so I needed a kidney. I was on dialysis for six months. And thank goodness, my 73 year old brother was able to donate his kidney. And we just celebrated two years of my new kidney. In 2013, I was diagnosed with uh, testicular cancer. And I got through that uh, with an operation, no chemo or radiation. And in 2015, I walked away from a, you know, a good corporate job. I just walked in one morning and said, that's enough. And I, I thought I got I to gotta go live life a little bit now. And a year and a half after that, um, I started having some weird sensations in my feet of numbness. Long story short, it took a year and a half of seeing doctors and specialists. And I got diagnosed with a very rare blood cancer that only affects about three people in a million called Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Uh, Brian and I uh, were high, we knew each other in elementary school and high school. I couldn't stand him. I thought he was uh, uh, too enthusiastic. He was like a little puppy, but we met many years later and we got married and we've been married 33 years now. But the Bensons aren't the only ones I knew who must still self-isolate. My name is Julia and I'm from Canada. Vancouver Island, and I've been just living life to the fullest. Julia is easily one of the most enthusiastic people I've ever known. We went to school together, and I can attest to her always sunny attitude. But even for her, the dark clouds of isolation threaten to loom over her psyche. So I have a rare syndrome titled Aprons. And it affects a lot of my physical body and also a tiny bit of my mental body. And through COVID, it's definitely been a real challenge with it. When nobody knew what it was or how it affected people, it would have affected my lungs and possibly even my breathing. It also affects my anxiety as well because I have a lot of anxiety around COVID and that kind of thing. I do go out every now and then, but I wear my mask, especially indoors, and I keep away from people who are not in my personal bubble and that kind of thing. Julia and the Bensons have certainly been through a lot. But while making this film, I decided I want to find some medically vulnerable people that were even closer to home for me. So I did. Literally. Nine months ago, I was um, diagnosed with breast cancer. Once I had my final pathology report, we realized that I had stage one microinvasive cancer. So it had left the duct, duct um, milk duct, and it could have, could have um, traveled to the rest of my body. You've had cancer twice, right? Yeah, this is the second time I've had cancer. Luckily, I didn't need chemotherapy because... It was only stage one, and I had chosen a, a mastectomy. Um, but the when you're post-surgery, it makes you vulnerable. You know, the your body's trying to heal from this trauma of surgery, so it, you know, it can't do the full job of trying to heal you and keeping your immune system up. So it makes me more vulnerable to infection. So you say you're a scientist. Can you go into detail about that? I have been a medical laboratory technologist for 36 years. So I've worked in science. I've worked uh, mostly in hospital settings. Something else that I have is experience being the mother of a medically fragile child, you Rob. Of course, my mom isn't the only family member I have that was involved with my health. While back home, I decided to get some perspectives from a pair who weren't medically vulnerable, but know firsthand what it means having a medically vulnerable person in their lives. Well, I was just an average, normal, naive kind of a Canadian without any real medical challenges in my life. This is my dad, Ron. But it wasn't until the transplants and we, you know, we were living at the Ronald McDonald House for the first one. And of course, the place is full of kids with cancer and their families and their extended families it became pretty obvious to me that we've got a lot of people in our population that are medically vulnerable. And then 
There's my little brother, Luke. What kind of pose should I have? Should I be have a very calm, relaxed pose? Whatever pose you want. <laughs> right into the camera. I would define Luke as the epitome of little sibling. He doesn't remember much of the transplants, having been a baby, but I had never known his perspective on what being my brother was really like. To think about it, like, when's the last time I hugged you, Rob? It's been, like, so long since I've even been able to touch you, let alone, like, we would have played Dungeons and Dragons all the time, and we haven't played Dungeons and Dragons in forever because, because of COVID. Of course I'm gonna do all of the like mandates, get vaccine mask and stuff to make sure that you're okay. Like, I don't want anything to happen to you. I've had lack of socialization. And because of that, it's caused me great anxiety and stress and that kind of thing, because I miss talking to people. I'm a people person. Like we've had no one in our house. We've not been into anybody's house. Uh, any visits we had were outside in our front yard. We only have people here who are double vaccinated, but we still don't have anybody in our house and we still aren't going to other people's houses, so. I have not been around people for since the beginning of COVID really in order to keep other people safe. Literally, we would cross the street if somebody was coming towards us. If I uh, come into a situation where I feel that there's a potential risk, then I ensure that, you know, I stay away from you for a couple of weeks at least. So that, for me, that's been the hardest part is not being able to just see my son. We didn't, we didn't go into a store up until about a month ago. More so with Margaret being a solid organ transplant recipient, we're, we're being very, 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 very cautious. When um, you had your transplants, the doctors told us that you're probably not going to die of rejecting your heart. You're going to die of an infection. As you might imagine, we have a lot of concerns about COVID. But something that Julia said really stuck out to me. Uh, what do you fear uh, most about COVID? Um, the big thing I fear most about it is a lot of people that are getting angry around the situation of COVID. Um, Forcing cohesion to be vaccinated, it's, uh, it's against the Nuremberg Code. As of recording this, there's still some pushback from small but vocal protest movements about vaccines, the vaccine passports, and mandates. The interviewees certainly had a lot to say about them. My life has been restricted so much because of people saying, well, it's my right, I don't have to get a, a vaccine, or it's my right, I don't need to show, I don't need to wear a mask. I have no rights right now because I'm petrified to go to, I won't go to a movie theater. I won't be going to hockey games. We don't even go out to rest restaurants. I have a bunch of people who I personally know who don't believe that COVID exists, that don't believe in the mask, that don't believe in anything. And you know, it's their choice, but keep away from me who, because I'm vulnerable. Well, I don't have a problem with the protesting because it's, uh, it's one of our rights in the Canadian Rights of Freedoms. What I do have a problem with is them doing their thing in front of the hospitals. Protesters on hospital roads today expressing their anger at vaccine mandates and other pandemic public health measures. Part of a series of planned demonstrations which organizers say are meant to stand up for personal freedoms. I see healthcare workers trying to go into work and where they've gone, you know, day after day for the last 18 months to try to save people. And I see people like, they're afraid to go in and these people are yelling. And meanwhile, inside an ICU, there's dying people of COVID in there. And when they go and they protest in front of a place that has saved my life numerous times, I am gobsmacked by that. You just feel like, like as a healthcare worker, why am I trying to? Like, it's not super high paying money for the abuse that you're getting to walk into your workplace. I think what I worry about is the health and safety of the people that are in that group and then the health and safety of the uh, caregivers and the and the health 
the caregivers because probably a lot of those people are going to end up in the hospital and having to be cared by the frontline workers. They scream rights and freedoms and liberties, but I always ask the same question. Have you read the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? And not one person has said to me, oh yeah, I've read it, I know it. And it's a document that's available online. Obviously, the anti-vax movements pose a great danger to our health as medically vulnerable people, and blocking hospitals at harassing health staff is far from helpful to society. But with 75% of eligible Canadians now vaccinated as of this recording, they're not actually the biggest problem. The biggest problem is stuff like this. Despite vaccinations, public gatherings like these still pose a huge public health risk. That's how we're getting more people sick. You know, I'm all for saying, make your decisions and you have a right to this. In this case, I don't think they have the right to be in a situation where they're with maybe not COVID people or like ourselves, transplant recipients, where they could endanger their lives. Outside, I think people need to be more careful. I think we need more distancing because um, you don't know in a crowd of people who's been vaccinated, who's not, who's vulnerable, or who's not. Do you think the mask mandate is fine too? It's not a restriction of freedoms? I don't think it's a restriction of freedoms. It's like the same thing as like washing your hands after you use the washroom. Like, you're not... It's, you know, I've heard people call it, oh, you have a diaper on your face. Well, guess what? Wouldn't you want, when you're in surgery and your stomach's open, uh, I bet you don't think it's a big deal when the surgeons and the nurses are wearing masks. What I've learned about this virus is that it's, it's airborne. And I'm not a scientist. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a doctor. But what makes sense to me in the simplest form is we transmit the virus through the moist air in our body. Right? We all know that now. So if I go to a library, the risk of transmission is going to be very low because if people are talking, they're whispering, and they're not forcing stuff out of their body. But when they go to a nightclub and they're yelling and screaming at each other, they're pushing the stuff all over the place. The people who don't wear them back in public, I mean, as long as they're keeping the distance from people, they can wear it outside, outdoors, that kind of thing. But inside, I mean, I. I definitely want people to follow the rules on that. Personal choices shouldn't impact other people's health. Because if, say it's my choice to, to not wear a mask, and that's like, it's, it'll, it, it'd be my choice to not have my mask on. But if I, if I get COVID to someone else, is that fair to them that I could have so easily done something to prevent them from getting COVID? I also believe even though the public health orders presently that you don't have to mask outside, I think if you're within six feet of someone and you don't know them, you should be masked in order to pre protect them and yourselves. And I think the other thing, Robbie, that gets me, you know, there's been some high profile people that have survived COVID. Hello, friends. Publicly, um, you know, denounce the vaccines. I'm not, I'm not an anti-vax person. Right. In fact, I said, I believe they're safe. I just said, I don't think that if you're a young, healthy person that you need it. Yet when they get sick. Feeling very weary. I had a headache and I just felt just run down. Quote, one particular person I'm thinking of, they threw the kitchen sink at him. So we immediately threw the kitchen sink at him. And he, he listed the different drugs that he had to go on. Monoclonal antibodies, uh, ivermectin, z pack to, to make sure he didn't die. Prednisone everything. And then a doctor came on and explained those five drugs that this person was willing to take to live. And I also got an NAD drip and a vitamin drip. And I did that three days in a row. Which are potentially far more damaging than ever taking the vaccine. So it's like these non-believers, they go along and they get COVID. And then it's like, give me everything you got. Give me everything you got to make sure I don't die. Well, why not get the vaccine in the first place? And, you know, yes, you might need more down the road every year or whatever, kind of like the H1N1, kind of like the flu shot, all that stuff. But you know what? If it protects us, those of us who are immune compromised, just do it. Just follow the rules and do it. You know, some people say, well, I don't trust the science. If you 
Google right now a pros of vaccine, you're gonna get like a billion Google results of peer-reviewed articles of like FDA approved vaccines and get all of like the, it's gone through all the single, every single step and I think, okay, well, if you don't believe the science, my question would be, do you believe the numbers? Look at the facts. Look at the people who are saying that these vaccines are real. Look at the percentage of people who are already vaccinated. When you look at the number of people in the hospital or in the hospital in critical care, the number of unvaccinated versus partial vaccinated versus fully vaccinated, the numbers don't lie. The numbers are there. So even if you didn't believe the science before, my question to these people that are doubters is do you believe the numbers? Of course, the vaccine isn't always as effective for people who have weak immune systems. So when this happens, Spring break forever! The chances for those with health problems to get sick skyrockets, along with anybody else. Yeah, any, any issues with getting the vaccine, I mean, the, the getting COVID, is worse. And the long-term potential effects that we are now seeing come out in the media, like the hockey player in Edmonton who has a heart condition now because of getting COVID. The hockey player that Brian is referring to is Josh Archibald, who played for the Edmonton Oilers. And I say played in past tense because he may never do so again. After contracting COVID, the unvaccinated Josh was diagnosed with a heart problem called myocarditis a known side effect of COVID, despite the fact that he was perfectly healthy. I don't think that if you're a young, healthy person, that you need it. Although myocarditis is a potential side effect of COVID vaccines, that potential is minuscule at best, and the majority of cases that are contracted are mild to intermediate in severity. If you do get COVID unvaccinated, the likelihood of not just myocarditis, but all sorts of other terrible ailments rises exponentially. Here's a list of some of the potential long-term problems you can get after getting a bad case of COVID. And if you get a severe case of COVID, which, again, is more likely to happen without a vaccine, or, if you're like me, and immune compromised, you're pretty likely to be put on a ventilator. I need a vent. I need a vent. And we don't want that. And I don't want to go through it again. You know, I've seen you being intubated several times and in emergency situations where you couldn't breathe on your own and you were crashing. And I tell you, I wouldn't wish it on anyone to be intubated or to watch their child or loved one being intubated. It was horrific. It was awful. You don't expect that when you have a child, right? I wish on the media, they would physically show somebody getting ventilated. We know, Margaret's been ventilated. Numerous we, times. We know what it's like to be ventilated. It's not an oxygen mask. They shove a tube down your throat. You can't talk. You can't eat. You get a feeding tube. You may lose your vocal cords. Your vocal cords may be damaged. You may not be able to come off the ventilator. It may be a lot of work. It's hard enough when it's an adult, but when it's a child, you know, an innocent child, at least I was able to be around you. Like now you're not even allowed visitors. So you're alone being intubated and um, being being sick and scared. We, we can prevent that. And people are screaming big pharma, but until you have a kid in ICU, uh, in my opinion, you don't get, you don't get an opinion on big pharma. So if you're comfortable with it, um, so I know it's triggering for you. Would you like to tell about what it was like to see me in ICU under a ventilator or intubator? If you're okay with that. Yeah, I am. Um, the first time that I saw you uh, being intubated in front of me, you were 13 months old and you were having... Uh, you were having an x-ray and you had been having abdominal pain and it was dark in the room and I was next to you and all of a sudden you stopped crying. You had been crying and you stopped crying and you know, the tech was happy because you stopped crying and she could get the x-ray except you weren't breathing and you were going and you were struggling and you like, I thought you just had this little body and you're raising up, your chest is rising up 
and your hands are going like this because all the oxygen's trying to go to your brain and, and, and your heart. And, uh, you know, this, we called uh, code blue and people came in and it took them about an hour to get you stable. And I watched through the whole thing. They cut your, your groin open to get a line in you because, you know, I, that, that stays with me forever. And it's, and, you know, watching you suffer like that, no one should have to go through that. I'm glad I was there because I talked, I talked to you the whole time, but just watching the tubes going down your throat and watching you struggle and then being in a bed, not being able to talk. And you just look at me with your big eyes, your big brown eyes. And you're like, with this tube coming down your, you know, your nose. And then the, all the machines going on. And then, then they'd have to suction you. So they'd put, uh, they put something down your nose, a tube, and then, you know, I could still hear the sounds and the beeping. Um, you know, it haunts me. And if we can prevent people from having to go through that, uh, you know, it was, it was brutal. It was brutal. And I saw you, I saw that happen to you more than once when you crashed. It's okay, Rob. It's okay. It's important to talk about it. I know. I'm still sorry anyways. It's all right. I live with it every day. <laughs> Yet so many people act like this is over. The virus has passed. We can get closer and closer to normal. Doing away with all the safety measures, restrictions, the masks, all of it. All the while, here us compromised people sit, waiting, fearing to drop our guard like scared animals, for the foreseeable future, continuing to be locked down. We live in community. Flight test, another step toward man in space. The surface appears to be uh, very, very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. We haven't gotten to where we are as a species by individual efforts. It's always been by community efforts. I'm going to step off the limb. That's one small step for man. Uh, this is Elvis Presley. I ask you to listen. Remember me. Now that's the voice of thousands who know the fight against polio is just as tough as it ever was. This is to keep people safe and to keep our community going. Some of them are paralyzed so that they can't even move a finger. Others can't do the simplest everyday things that we take so much for granted. Being vaccinated against a pandemic virus um, not only protects me, but protects um, my community, you know, my family, Robbie, you're vulnerable to it, our elderly people, people in the hospital, and people that will potentially get sick. The things that we're doing correctly, like wearing the masks, socially distancing, all that stuff is working and it is getting better in the different places because of that. One of the things that really stood out to me is this love, not fear, love, not fear. You know what the ultimate thing to love is? Is to actually do something to protect someone that you don't even know. When I go to get my vaccine, of course I'm thinking about like what it could do to me, but I'm not thinking about like the long term repercussions on getting the vaccine because I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want grandma to get hurt. I don't want any of my family to have to die or have any permanent uh, injuries due to COVID. Putting a mask on and keeping your distance is is loving someone. It's loving other people. When you know, when you look at it from a very simple perspective, you know, we're trying to prevent ourselves from 
transmitting this virus that's in our spit, right? So if we cover up our faces, then it's gonna help. Sometimes it feels like we're running in circles. Protest this, mandate that, cases up, cases down. Yet there is hope on the horizon. Things are getting better. The number of cases and deaths are going down. But for as many of us to get to the other side as possible, we need to work together. Because my family and I can attest that working together as a community, big or small, can be truly powerful. During the transplants, my dad lost his media company. My mom couldn't work. We almost lost our home. But it was thanks to community, caring for others, and medical science that I can talk to you now. Not quite knowing what I'm doing, just that I'm doing my part. And sometimes that's the best thing you can do. I'm doing my part to get this COVID under control and that kind of thing. And some people who I know who are not getting vaccinated, who don't believe in the vaccine, they're watching me be an example, get the vaccine and all that stuff. If we want the world to go back to, you know, traveling and being safe and then we all need to be vaccinated if we can be medically. And I, I hear people talking about COVID. All it's doing is killing old people or the medically vulnerable people. If only the healthy people are okay and the people who are at risk get ill, isn't that how it's supposed to be? Those are people too. I know many medically vulnerable people that are, that are good people too, that, you know, shouldn't have their life put in risk from other people not wanting to put a piece of cloth over their mask. I guess because I've always lived my life, tried to live it as best I can to the fullest. And even though, you know, I, I had a transplant and still have to be careful, I really want people to realize how lucky they are if they have good health and to not take that for granted. Healthy people are always one step away from being medically vulnerable. There must be a couple people in every single family that is medically vulnerable, and maybe some people don't know about it and could get them killed. And if you're offered an opportunity to stay healthy and avoid this illness, this uh, COVID, then take that opportunity because I was never given that opportunity to live a life of excellent health. I've always been sick, like you, Robbie. We've always been sick and always had to watch things and be careful of things. And there are moments I'm frustrated with this whole thing and wish people would realize that how lucky they are. So I just want people to realize, please, be careful with your health. Don't take it for granted. And if you're ever given an opportunity to save your life or save your health, do whatever it takes to, to do that. You know, my hope is that a lot more people get vaccinated and, you know, wear the mask in public, wear the mask around other people who are more vulnerable to getting this COVID and that kind of thing. The reason I'm doing it is to be an example to those people who don't want to do it. We have uh, lots of people around us that we don't know uh, what kind of vulnerability they may live with. So uh, I I'm a social creature. I live in a community and I think it's the right thing to do. Just before COVID hit, my grandpa Bob died. I told him, as he laid there on the hospital bed in his final days, how everybody had nothing but good things to say about him. His calming atmosphere, his kindness, his humor. And I'll never forget one of the last things he said to me. I always try to be kind to others because we all end up the same. And it's true. Vulnerable or healthy, we all end up the same. Yeah, sure, us medically vulnerable people, we might be a minority. But at the end of the day, we're still human. Humans kept alive by the power of medical science and community. We still have lives. We still have families. People we care about. Communities. Things we want to do, want to accomplish, want to strive for. We never asked to be this way. Nobody asks to be sick. 
I can't tell you how to interpret this documentary. That's up for you to decide. But I'm still human. And like Julia said, I'm just trying to live life to the fullest and do my part. Like anyone else, there's just a lot of barriers to that. Potentially deadly barriers. I didn't have any in-person college classes uh, last year, but now I'm getting into it and it feels so good because we know what we're dealing with now. We know the impact of this virus and the vaccine and I feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel. I don't mean that we should lift up all of the mandates and just like party in the streets like crazy. Sure, that would be awesome, but that is not the right thing to do. And I think that as humans, we, we can combine our might together and really get through this together. I mean, get your head on straight. Stop being ignorant and look at the, the people who are you potentially putting at risk. Yeah. If you decide to go out and to not be careful, not distance, not mask, heck, not even vaccinate, think of how that might affect me. Or the Bensons. Or Julia. Or my mom. All of our families and so, so many more. Just keep us in mind. That's all I ask. We still have a lot of hills to climb over before this whole thing is done. But as my dad always used to say, what goes up must come down. Medically vulnerable people are people too. They should be treated as such and not as a statistic. All right, thanks. Thanks, I gotta listen to that in post now. <laughs> Just be like, okay, it's over. <laughs>